Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me to join you today at this fantastic sustainable fashion summit. My name is Sarah Ditti and I'm the Global Policy Director at Fashion Revolution. Fashion Revolution was founded in the wake of the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, which killed more than 1,100 garment workers, mostly women on the 24th of April in 2013. In that building, there were five garment factories sewing clothes for many well-known multinational apparel brands and retailers. Some of these brands did not know their clothes were being made in the facilities in that building because their supply chains operate as complex and opaque webs where subcontracting is common in order to deliver products quickly and for very cheap prices. So we at Fashion Revolution decided to push for greater visibility and transparency of these supply chains because without knowing where clothes are made, it is virtually impossible to protect vulnerable people and the planet. Since then, Fashion Revolution has become the world's largest fashion activism movement, mobilizing citizens, industry, and policymakers through our research, education, and advocacy work. Together through a global network with teams in over 100 countries, we work towards a vision of a fashion industry that conserves and restores the environment and values people over growth and profit. We believe that making positive change does not fall in any single person, brand, or company, and this is why we focus on using our collective voices to transform the entire system. We believe that with systemic and structural change, the fashion industry can lift millions of people out of poverty and provide them with decent and dignified livelihoods and that it can conserve and restore our living planet. The fashion industry can, when done well, bring people together and be a great source of joy, creativity, and expression for both individuals and communities. Since Rana Plaza happened, we have seen a lot of positive change but it's mostly been incremental rather than transformative and structural change, which this industry so desperately needs in order to ensure a disaster like Rana Plaza never happens again. Unfortunately, human rights abuses and environmental degradation remain rife across the industry. People are still dying in regular factory fires and accidents. And although wages have increased in some of the countries where clothing is made, Many people in the supply chain are still paid too little and struggle to afford life's most basic necessities. Women textile and garment workers frequently face sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. Trade unions and workers' ability to organize and fight for their rights continue to be hamstrung by employers and governments. And unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic has stalled, if not reversed, some of the good progress that has been made to improve conditions in the places where our clothes are made. The fashion industry also carries on polluting the atmosphere and our waterways. Ancient forests are still being cut down to create leathers and textiles. Animals are regularly mistreated and landfills are piling up with our disused clothes and textiles. Although having said that, the general public in many countries are becoming increasingly aware of these problems over the past seven years. 
Our recent consumer survey research has certainly shown this to be true. But still, many people remain in the dark, unaware that their clothes may be contributing to the climate crisis and human exploitation. And as consumers, it's still very difficult to find credible, robust information about the working conditions and environmental impacts behind what we wear. These are the many reasons why we still need a fashion revolution. We must keep up the momentum. We must keep working together towards real transformative change in this industry so that all of these problems I'm talking about today become a thing of the past. It's not all doom and gloom, but I do want this presentation to act as a call to arms for you participating today. First, let me talk a little bit more specifically about what's changed since Rana Plaza collapsed. Starting in Bangladesh, working conditions for many of the 4.5 million textile and garment workers have improved. Workplaces are safer, due in large part to the Bangladesh Accord on Fire and Building Safety, which is a legally binding agreement and program between local and international trade unions and multinational fashion brands sourcing in Bangladesh. This initiative has inspected and monitored fire and building safety upgrades in thousands of garment and textile factories across the country. As a result, there has been a measurable decrease in the number of severe factory accidents in Bangladesh each year since Rana Plaza. Transparency has become a much more normalized part of doing business. And it's fair to say that, I, that we know much more about clothing manufacturers and their links to major fashion brands than we did seven years ago. Back in 2013, when we first started campaigning on transparency, only about a handful of big brands disclosed a list of the factories where their clothing is made. Since then, over 200 large fashion brands have published their supplier lists and this number can, can, continues to grow. Several trade unions, Journalists and worker rights groups are now making use of these supplier lists to identify and solve problems facing the people making our clothes, and this has meant real positive impact on workers' lives. Legislation in some countries has also been introduced to address some of fashion's worst impacts. So, for example, human rights due diligence legislation has been gaining steam in the past few years. This involves companies being legally required to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address harmful human rights impacts in their business and supply chains. In May 2019, the Dutch government adopted the Child Labor Due Diligence Law. This requires companies selling goods or services to Dutch consumers to identify and prevent child labor in their supply chains. And in a similar way, in 2017, France adopted the Corporate Duty of Vigilance Law, requiring very large companies in France to identify and prevent adverse human rights and environmental impacts resulting from not just their own, own business activities, but from the activities of the companies they control and from the activities of their subcontractors and suppliers as well. And now, similar human rights due diligence legislation is being considered in Germany, Finland, Switzerland, and we're expecting proposed human rights due diligence legislation uh, from the European Commission in 2021. Meanwhile, in June 2019, the International Labour Organization adopted the very important groundbreaking Convention 190, eliminating violence and harassment in the world of work, which recognizes formally that the right of everyone to work in an environment free from violence and harassment, and that includes gender-based abuse. Of course, in the past five years, we have also seen the Paris Agreement on Climate Change adopted and the post-2020 global biodiversity framework now being developed in order to protect the health of our planet and its precious ecosystems. Consumer awareness has also reached a crucial tipping point Fashion and culture magazine Another declared in December 2019 that sustainability is no longer a fringe issue within fashion, but the most defining challenge and opportunity of our time. According to recent research from consultancy firm McKinsey, online searches for sustainable fashion 
have tripled between 2016 and 2019. And Business of Fashion wrote in 2019 that transparency has become an important issue further upstream in the supply chain with consumers increasingly concerned about issues including fair labor, sustainable resourcing, and the environment. And consumers want to support brands that are doing good in the world with 66% willing to pay more for sustainable products and 42% of millennials saying that they want to know what goes into the products um, they buy and how they are made before they buy them. Meanwhile, mainstream media has been covering human rights and environmental issues in fashion in a way they never really have before, which is really exciting. Major news outlets and leading fashion press, which just seven years ago only sporadically covered human rights and environmental issues in the industry, now seem to publish investigations, opinion pieces, documentaries, at least weekly. And in fact, in 2018, Vogue Australia appointed its first ever sustainability editor at large, and now sustainability editors are being hired at various glossy fashion publications all over the world, including our own Fernanda Simone, who leads our team in Brazil, recently appointed as Vogue Brazil's first ever contributing sustainability editor, for which uh, we are super proud of her. Clothing consumption patterns um, were certainly beginning to change before the pan pandemic struck, at least in the UK and Europe. In October 2019, the big investment bank Morgan Stanley reported that the apparel industry is facing structural decline as consumers with what they said too much stuff cut back on the number of new outfits they buy, even as prices fall. And they argued that apparel consumption, at least in Western markets, was plateauing. And this was happening for a couple of crucial reasons. First, because consumers had reached peak consumption. And second, because of a rising consumer awareness of it, the environmental damage being done by the apparel industry. As a result of these trends, at least in part, the world's leading dozen listed apparel brands and retailers have on average seen their earnings decrease nearly 40% since the beginning of 2016. And Morgan Stanley forecasts that the majority of big brands and retailers are likely to continue struggling. Now, I can only imagine that this trend has become even more apparent as a result of the pandemic, forcing us all into lockdown, shops closing their doors, and people not really having the need to buy any new clothes anyway. The whole market has experienced major shockwaves recently, I'm sure as we all have seen <laughs> and noticed. We are in the, a moment where everything is still very much in flux. And we have the opportunity, the real opportunity, to shape the future direction of the global fashion industry. Also, before the pandemic, we were seeing a rise in alternative forms of clothing consumption, such as reuse, rental, and swapping. Again, really exciting developments. And the resale market actually grew 21 times faster in the U.S. than any other type of fashion retail over the past three years. So it's going to be interesting to see how alternative business models flourish once we come out the other side of the virus. So despite all this good progress, we are still just tinkering at the edges of transformative change in this industry. There are still so many deep-rooted problems that continue to occur at all levels of the global fashion value chain. Millions of people working in the industry, especially among those making our clothes, are systematically faced with low pay, racial and gender discrimination, unsafe working and living conditions, and harassment and abuse. Meanwhile, structural racism continues to underpin how much of the industry functions, and this manifests within the fashion industry in many different ways, including, but not limited to, a lack of diversity on catwalks and in fashion magazines, little diversity in the boardrooms and offices of major fashion businesses, discrimination in the workplace, overtly racist product design and marketing, and colonial trade routes being largely unchanged from what they were 150 years ago at the height of European colonial exploitation, as educator Celine Seaman uh, from the Slow Factory Foundation has written about extensively. 
So this means countries such as India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and others, you know, continue to produce cheap disposable clothes for the privileged wealthy consumers in the West. The fashion industry also also continues to use too many precious non-renewable resources, and the public consumes way more clothes than we need, and this creates too much waste that simply cannot be regenerated. As a society, we buy more clothes, wear them less, and dispose of them more quickly than ever before in history. And the majority of the clothes we discard either end up in landfill or incineration. Less than 1% of textiles and clothes are genuinely recycled into new textiles and clothes even when they are collected for reuse and recycling. The technology is simply not available to recycle textiles in a truly circular way at scale. This is an enormous problem for our environment and for the communities where our discarded clothes often end up, not to mention a massive waste of precious resources and people's time and talent and money. But things are starting to change and we are seeing new techniques and technologies begin to emerge to address the industry's environmental impacts, especially when it comes to waste and recycling. However, it must be said that the global fashion industry, like the rest of our global economy, has been designed to value profit and growth above all else. In fact, in many countries, companies are required by law to ensure that shareholder value is prioritized above all else, no matter the consequences for workers, communities, and the environment. This simply has to change if we're going to end labor exploitation ensure that global warming doesn't exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, and restore the biodiversity that has been decimated in recent years. We simply need new models of valuing the industry. The coronavirus pandemic has certainly revealed some of the industry's ugliest systemic problems, and it's unlikely that things will ever go back to business as usual, or at least not for a very long time. So the question now is how will the fashion industry adapt and evolve from this crisis? Will we lose the momentum that has been accelerating across the industry towards addressing and improving human rights and environmental issues? Will the progress that has been achieved over the past few years be easily reversed? Or will this be the opportunity to build back better as many people are referring to it? Will we use this moment to reimagine how the global fashion industry can fundamentally work better for people and for planet? Part of me feels unfortunately quite cynical about where things are headed. In the Western world, when the virus forces all to stay home and shops shut their doors, many billion dollar multinational brands canceled orders from their suppliers pretty much overnight. And this had a catastrophic impact on workers in the supply chain, many of who are already hugely exploited and working in very precarious conditions. Factories were bankrupted, workers lost months of wages, many workers were laid off altogether, unionized workers were particularly targeted for dismissal, workers struggled to put food on the table to protect themselves from the risk of catching coronavirus and to access proper protective equipment for themselves and for their families, whether at home or in the workplace. It became very, very clear that despite all of the talk over the last many years by big brands about working in mutual partnership with their suppliers, that all that really matters at the end of the day is protecting their own profits. Some brands even paid out shareholder dividends while leaving their suppliers and workers in the supply chain unpaid, which really does say it all. The other part of me feels much more optimistic, though, about where the industry could go from here. This really could be an opportunity to rethink how things are done. I think being forced to stay at home has made a lot of people reevaluate how much stuff we really need. And that could potentially change consumption patterns in a positive way for a long time. Public conversations about what to do about climate change also seem to be accelerating. And there seems to be much more public recognition that fashion has a huge impact on the planet. 
And of course, there's also increasing political priority on actions to halt the worst effects of climate change. As the fashion industry is in such flux, this may just be the moment where we see the smaller, sustainable, sustainability-minded brands and designers really shine. The ones who aren't on the fast fashion hamster wheel and not facing the same virus-related market constraints that the big players are facing. I hope we do see these smaller, sustainability-minded brands shine in the years to come. But only time will tell, and I would encourage you all to use this unique time as a moment of reflection on how you can do better in your own wardrobe, how you can be more sustainably-minded in your own business, how you can use your voice and voting power to ensure that the government where you live is taking action to make the fashion industry work for people and planet, and how you can use whatever platform you have to ensure that the fashion industry moves in the right direction from now on. Thank you so much. 네, 우리가 패션을 소모하면서부터 발생하는 인권 문제, 환경 문제에 대한 얘기를 나누면서 패션 산업의 전체 시스템의 변화에 대해서 다시금 생각해 볼수 있는 시간이 아니었나 싶습니다. 몇 가지 질문을 통해서 패션 혁명에 대해서 알아볼까 하는데요. 패션 레볼루션의 활동 중 가장 기억에 남는 것은 무엇이었는지 궁금합니다. Fashion Revolution is most well known for our Who Made My Clothes social media campaign that we launched back in 2014. It became number one global trend on Twitter on the anniversary of Rana Plaza um, that, that first year in 2014. And each year we see hundreds of thousands of um, uses of the hashtag, you know, people taking to social media to ask the brands they wear this seemingly simple question, you know, who made my clothes? 네, 제품의 근로 조건, 환경적 영향에 대해서 투명하고 신뢰할 수 있는 정보를 소비자들에게 전달하기 위해서는 무엇이 선행되어야 된다고 생각하시나요? For which so many brands still struggle to answer due to the complexity and fragmentation of supply chains in the global fashion industry, you know, due to the lack of transparency and traceability in brand supply chains. And six years on from launching this hashtag, this question is still really, really important. Um, despite that there has been, you know, some, some progress made on supply chain transparency across the industry, we still, um, there's still very, very little visibility of the people working in the supply chain. You know, we as consumers and brand themselves still know too little information about the people who are working in their supply chain. Who are they? How much are they getting paid? What conditions are they working in? How do we work together in solidarity um, with them to lift their working conditions and living standards? We've also recently launched a new hashtag um, called What's In My Clothes? which we launched this year and we will continue to drive that conversation going forward which is asking people to consider and question brands and governments around you know what are the chemicals what are the materials what are the impacts of those materials in the clothes that we wear um, you know, because there's a lot of toxic chemicals that are used in our clothes. They, you know, the, there's a lot of fibers, um, or there's certainly a lot of plastics that are used in our clothes, which mean they're not biodegradable, which means they release pi pla microplastics in the ocean. So this is um, a tool to get that conversation really started around, you know, what are our clothes made of, basically. So what must be done to deliver transparent information to consumers i mean as consumers it's just still so difficult to find credible comparable robust information about the working conditions and environmental impacts um, behind the products we buy and the, and the brands we support with our money um, fashion revolution's been our movement's been pushing brands to disclose more information about their policies and practices and impacts on sustainability and human rights issues for you know for nearly seven years now 
but this is still something brands ultimately do voluntarily and if they want to um you know if, if they want to disclose that information they will um you know but they also don't have to because it's not required by law and that means that progress on transparency and on accountability for human rights and environmental issues the progress is on the, on those issues is limited ultimately we need much better legislation in each of our countries to ensure that consumers have access to information that enables to make them or it en enables them to make more sustainable choices about what they wear and gives them some reassurance and some trust that they can they genuinely know um that they are not contributing to human exploitation and the destruction of the environment unwittingly. 노동 환경 문제 등 다양한 문제점에 대해서 기업의 책임 그리고 소비자의 자세, 국가의 지원 등이세 가지 요소에 대해서 본받을 만한 사례가 있다면 하나 알려 주시죠. You know, I, I I wouldn't say there isn't necessarily one country in the world that is leading on making big improvements on labor um, and environmental protections in the fashion industry. There have been some important new policies and legislation in several countries. So for example, France is doing more than most other countries by recently passing laws that require very large companies to conduct um, risk assessment on human rights and environmental issues in their supply chain and then report on that annually. Um, French companies, they also now have to pay a levy according to how much um, products they put on the market that might go to waste and then that the money raised through this levy helps pay for better recycling infrastructure in France. This is called extended producer responsibility legislation. And there's also a lot of um, momentum on circular economy and circular textiles and sustainable product labeling in the European Union that we're expecting to see proposed legislation for in 2021. So that's definitely something for us all to keep our eye on and, and learn from. The fashion revolution is a very important campaign. Do you have any campaigns in the future? So in addition to the campaigns that you know, we have been working on for the past seven years, I mean, as I said, we're starting to look more closely at how the fashion industry is contributing to the climate crisis and like what we all can do to reduce the industry's impacts you know through our own wardrobes through the brands we may run the businesses we work in um and our power as citizens who vote for elected officials um we as i said we've recently launched this new what's in my clothes um hashtag encouraging consumers in the industry to consider the environmental impact of the materials used for clothing and to question some of the very harmful toxic and polluting processes used to um treat our clothes and we also um focus a lot on kind of changing our relationship with clothes as consumers so really encouraging people that the most sustainable garment um, is the one that you already own. And we talk a lot about this issue with our hashtag love clothes last um, and really encouraging people to kind of challenge the need to always buy something new and that perhaps, you know, the first place to go shopping is in your own wardrobe. Um, if you have things in your wardrobe that are perfectly wearable like but you maybe you just don't love the fit anymore maybe you can get it tailored maybe you can um add an embellishment maybe you can dye it a new color to make it you know more more appealing to what you feel like wearing at the moment in south korea specifically um you know we would we would invite those who might be interested to start a fashion revolution group um to get in touch uh, we don't actually have a fashion revolution team in South Korea at the moment, so if anyone's interested, please get in touch with us um, at uh, info at fashionrevolution.org. Um, you know, Korea has such a rich history of textile production, of craft, of manufacturing, of very innovative design, and it would it 
could certainly become a world leader on sustainability in the fashion industry very soon. We would love to um, to be part of that that um, future for fashion in Korea. Thank you so much. Sarah Di Tim, 감사합니다. 앞으로의 캠페인도 열심히 응원하도록 하겠습니다. 패션 레볼루션의 발전을 기원합니다. 네, 지속가능 패션 서밋 서울 프리 서밋을 마무리하고자 합니다. 오늘 함께한 세 분의 연사의 발표를 함께하면서 그동안 우리의 편의를 위해서 또 우리의 욕심으로 인해서 파괴된 환경과 인권 문제에 대해서 이야기를 나눠봤습니다. 이는 코로나 이전부터 문제시되었던 부분이었는데요. 이에 대한 해결책을 조금씩 실천하기도 전에 현재 코로나19 팬데믹으로 인해서 일회용 플라스틱에 대한 소비는 더욱더 증가하고 있는 추세라고 합니다. 미국의 한 대학의 연구진에 따르면 전 세계적으로 퍼진 코로나19 때문에 포장 및 배달 음식의 섭취가 늘어나게 되었고요. 병원에서 사용된 의료용 가운, 장갑, 주사기 등 의료 폐기물로 인해서 전 세계 플라스틱 폐기물이 또한 증가 추세에 있다고 합니다. 이에 환경학자들은 현재 인간은 코로나19로 인해서 경제에 대한 타격뿐만 아니라 플라스틱 폐기물로 인한 환경오염 악화로 또 다른 감염병의 위기에 놓일 수도 있다고 지적을 하고 있습니다. 네, 이제 우리는 코로나19 이전의 세계로 돌아갈 수는 없습니다. 지금부터라도 전 세계적으로 모든 사람들이 지속 가능하고 윤리적인 가치에 대해서 고민하고 행동한다면 지금 우리가 저한 현실보다 조금 더 나은 미래를 만들어 나갈 수 있지 않을까요? 지속가능 패션 서밋 서울 함께해 주신 모든 분들께 감사드리면서 오늘 여기서 마치도록 하겠습니다. 내일은 세션 1 Find Your Sustainable로 오후 4시에 찾아뵙도록 하겠습니다. 내일도 여러분의 많은 관심을 기다리겠습니다.